Let us continue to worship God in prayer. Almighty God, the great I am that I am, the ancient of days, Lord, without your spirit working in us, we are unable to understand your word. Pour out your spirit upon each one of us. Open the ears of our hearts and enable us to hear your voice and pay close attention to your word. Father, anoint your feeble servant with your spirit and enable me to honor you by speaking faithfully and strengthen me by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Starting from today, we will take a journey through the book of Deuteronomy. One commentator calls Deuteronomy the heartbeat of the Old Testament. And he invites the reader, feel the pulse of Deuteronomy, and you are in touch with the life and rhythm of the whole Hebrew Bible. Another commentator says, Deuteronomy offers the most systematic presentation of theological truth in the entire Old Testament. Deuteronomy is quoted more than 80 times in the New Testament. So along with Genesis, Psalms, and the prophet Isaiah, Deuteronomy is one of the most often quoted books in the New Testament. It's a very exciting book to study, and if you have not done so recently, I encourage you to read through it. The title Deuteronomy is from the Greek translation, the Greek title of this book, and it literally means the second law. But this Greek title can be misleading because there is no second law. It is better understood as the second giving of the law by Moses to the second generation of Israel. It is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is much more than a dry legal book. Those of us who have read IRS documents know how dry they are. But Deuteronomy is nothing but dry. Its purpose is not simply to describe what the law is. According to Deuteronomy, the law is about life. And the giving of the law is a life and death matter. And Moses gives the law to the next generation with passion, urgency, and pressing concerns. Very soon, the next generation will enter the promised land under the new leadership of Joshua. Moses himself is not able to enter the promised land. So this is his last opportunity to teach the next generation. And the crucial question is, how will the faith of the parents continue in the next generation? Will their children have faith? Will their grandchildren have faith? This is a crucial question for each generation. Faith cannot simply be handed to the next generation, just as a baton is passed from one runner to the next. Passing on the faith does not happen automatically. Faith is always one generation from dying out. A congregation is always one generation from extinction. 
This is a sober reality that we need to address with a sense of urgency. Now back in Deuteronomy, uh, I'm sorry, Numbers 25, in the plains of Moab, we saw how even the next generation quickly fell into the temptation of idolatry. When they go into the promised land, they will be surrounded by pagan nations. And the temptation to fall into idolatry will be even greater. Today, we are facing a similar situation. When Americans are asked to specify their religion in a multiple choice question, almost 70% 70 70 would put a check mark next to Christianity. But we know that that's far from reality. A more in-depth survey indicates that only 2% of the millennials hold to biblical teachings. The vast majority of the millennials are vaguely religious, or in their own words, spiritual. They are almost indistinguishable from the secular culture. Faith is all, always one generation from dying out. So how can we pass on the faith to the next generation? Deuteronomy is asking the same question. That's why it's so relevant for us today. The date that Moses began his second giving of the law to the next generation is precisely dated in Deuteronomy 1 verse 3. In the 40th year, that is the 40th year after they came out of Egypt, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them, meaning the next generation. Since the first giving of the law at the foot of Mount Sinai, almost 40 years have passed. A lot of things happened during those 40 years in the wilderness. The first generation of Israel who came out of Egypt have died off in the wilderness. Only the second generation are left. The majority of, majority of them were born in the wilderness. They have known no other life than the life in the wilderness. Now they are encamped in the plains of Moab. We have the uh, background, uh, the uh, chroma changed a little bit so that we can see the yellow, if possible. <laughs> so they are encamped in the plains of Moab on the east side of the Jordan River. The promised land is within sight, just across the river. Under the leadership of Joshua, they will soon enter the promised land. They are standing on the boundary. The boundary between the wilderness and the promised land. The boundary between the past and the future. Every generation lives on the boundary between the past and the future. Every generation must pass on their faith to the next generation. Again, the crucial question is, how will the faith continue in the next generation? What is the mo message of Moses to the next generation so that they may continue in faith? First of all, Moses reminds the next generation over and over in Deuteronomy that they must remember the past, especially their roots. Their roots go way back 
to God's promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God's redemption from the bondage of slavery. Now, one thing that appears really strange to us today is that Moses addresses the next generation as if they were present in Egypt, when the majority of them know nothing about Egypt. He addresses them as you, plural, as if they were present with their parents when they were not even born. Moses says to the next generation, you were enslaved in Egypt. You saw how God delivered you from the bondage of slavery. You heard the voice of God when he spoke at the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses speaks as if the children were there. That's because both the parents and the children are rooted in what God has done. They are from the same roots. Their parents' story is their story. That's why we today, some 120 generations after Moses, living in the 21st century America, we can still say, we were slaves in Egypt. We saw how God delivered us from the bondage of sin. We heard the voice of God when he spoke to us at the foot of Mount Sinai. So as we today stand on the boundary between the past and the future, we remember, we must remember our roots, where we came from, to whom we belong, and how God redeemed us from the bondage of sin. Those who forget their roots are bound to forget who they are. Those who forget their roots are like cut flowers. They look fresh for a little while, but flowers cut from their roots will wither. We must remember our roots. Now, I must also speak to my own generation, that is the parents' generation. The greatest gift we as parents can pass on to the next generation is our biblical values. These are values such as faithfulness to our spouse, honoring our elderly parents, integrity, truthfulness in speech, keeping the Sabbath holy and spending time with the family, living for the good of others, honoring God as holy, just to name a few. These are the greatest gift we can pass on to the next generation. But sometimes we confuse our preferences and methodologies with biblical values, and we try to pass on our preferences and methodologies on the next generation, but that's going to stifle the next generation. We need to give them freedom to experiment, to fail and learn, and to be the agents of their own change. We as parents must give them freedom to do so. So that is the past. Then what about the future? When the next generation go into the promised land, they will face at least two major challenges, two major changes. Now for the past 40 years, they have relied on God to provide manna, the miraculous bread from heaven every day. And all they have to do is to go outside the camp and collect the manna. But once they go into the promised land, the manna will stop. They will have to learn to farm, sow the seed, harvest the crop, 
and eat the produce of the land. In fact, the book of Joshua 5.12 says that the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. So that's one major change that they will be facing. Another major change is that they will no longer be guided by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Up until now, the pillar of cloud and fire has been with them right in the middle of the camp. 24 hours a day, they could see the pillar and cloud, pillar of cloud and fire with their own eyes. And they would know that the presence of God is near. And whenever the pillar of cloud lifted, they would follow it. But when they go into the promised land, the tribes of Israel will disperse throughout the land and settle in the region allotted to them. They will no longer have the pillar of cloud and fire to guide them. So what then will be their guide? Will God be more distant when the pillar of cloud and fire is no longer there? That's the dilemma that Moses is, is addressing in Deuteronomy 4, verse 7. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them? The way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to Him. You see, Moses is saying we don't have to see physical signs. God is near us whenever we pray to Him. God is near us even when we don't see Him with our eyes. There are times when God seems far away, when God seems silent and does not seem to answer our prayer. The psalmist laments, Why are you, O God, so far from me? Why are you so far from my cries of anguish? Why are you silent? Even in such times, God is near us whenever we pray to Him. God is near us whenever we cry out to Him. God is near us even in our lament. Now still, the question remains, when the next generation go into the land, how will God guide them? The answer is very simple but also very relevant for us today. Their primary guide will be the Word of God. Throughout the book of Deuteronomy, there is a great emphasis on the Word of God. Now, I don't want to be too technical here, but with uh, some Bible apps and computer, we can quickly count the number of times certain words occur in Deuteronomy. The exact number is not important, but we get a general sense of which words are important in Deuteronomy. So, the verb to speak and its noun form, word, occur 166 times in Deuteronomy. And the verb to say, to command, and its noun form, commandment, to hear, Shama in Hebrew, and the word to keep or to obey. All of these words that have to do with speaking, hearing, and obeying the word are very prevalent in Deuteronomy. So we get a general sense of how central 
the word of God is in Deuteronomy. And Moses reinforces that in chapter 4, verse 11. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, while it blazed with fire to the very heavens, with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. Moses is saying to the next generation, you saw the mountain blazing with fire with your own eyes, and God spoke out of the fire. But do not confuse the fire with God. You can never see God. You can never see his form. So do not ever mistake the fire for God. But you can hear his voice. You can listen to his word. So when you go into the promised land, the word of God will be your guide. Unmistakably, the Bible gives priority to listening over seeing. Now we might ask, why listening over seeing? The immediate reason is given in Deuteronomy 4.15. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or like any creature. Now, you might say, that's a temptation for ancient people. We today know better. We don't bow down to images carved in wood or stone. That's not our temptation today. Well, there is some truth to that. But fundamentally, idolatry is not external. Idolatry arises from the heart. As Martin Luther said, Idols are whatever our heart clings to and relies upon. Idolatry takes different forms in our time, but fundamentally it arises from the heart. So we must make sure that our heart does not cling to things other than God. So. But how does our heart change? Does our heart change by seeing or hearing? It's interesting that there is emphasis on hearing over seeing throughout the Bible. The Apostle Paul does not say that faith comes from seeing. Instead, in Romans 10 verse 17, he says, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Also, our Lord Jesus says in John 6, 63, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Throughout the Bible, there is emphasis on hearing. And I wonder why that's the case. Perhaps seeing is an automatic response. We don't have to make any effort to see a flash of lightning. And we react automatically to what we see. And hearing as a sensory experience is also automatic. We don't have to make any effort to hear a thunder. But the kind of hearing the Bible talks about does not happen automatically. It's the kind of hearing that requires us to pause all our activities, be silent, surrender our agendas, 
and pay close attention. It's the kind of hearing that happens when we communicate deeply with each other. It's the kind of hearing that happens when we love each other. And that's the kind of hearing that Moses is talking about. Moses commands the next generation, Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel. That's the first line of the Shema prayer, which the Jewish people recite every day during morning and evening prayers. Shema is the imperative form of the Hebrew verb Shema, which means to hear or to listen. Shema is not merely hearing the sound. It's not having the sound go in one ear and out the other. Shema means listen with the heart. Moses commands them, Shema Israel, listen with your heart. Listen attentively. Pay close attention. Give your full attention. Think deeply about what you're hearing. Take it to heart. Hear it with your heart. Hear it and obey it. So in Deuteronomy, there is clear emphasis on hearing the word. And Moses takes it further. There is a, a very common Hebrew word that surprisingly does not appear at all from Genesis to Numbers and appears for the first time in Deuteronomy. And that word is to learn or to teach. These two words share the same root in Hebrew and they mean either to learn or to teach depending on their form. And that word appears twice in Deuteronomy 4, verse 10. Assemble the people before me to hear my words, so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land, and may teach them to their children. Moses calls the next generation to be students and teachers of God's word. This is a calling to be a community of students and teachers, a community that takes the study of God's word seriously, a community that equips everyone to study God's word, a community that teaches people to obey everything God has commanded. And this is closely related to our calling to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Disciples are simply students or apprentices who learn from their master. That's what the word disciple means in the Greek, student or apprentice. Now by learning, we are not talking about acquiring information or learning to profess the right beliefs about Christ. Our learning begins with Shema. We learn by paying close attention to the word of Christ, listening to his word with our heart, thinking deeply about what we are hearing. And Shema leads to obedience. That's why Shema is often translated obey. So Shema leads to living out his word, obeying his commandments, spending time with Christ, following him moment by moment. That is discipleship. The fruit of discipleship is not more information, but the character that we take in. We take, we take on the character of our Lord Jesus. And we get to know the heart of Christ. 
and what concerns Christ becomes ours, and what makes Christ joyful becomes ours as well. At the same time, so disciples are students or apprentices. At the same time, disciples are called to teach others to be disciples. To teach others what they themselves have lived out. One of the last commands in our, that our Lord Jesus gave is the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But here's the part that, part of the Great Commission, that we often skip, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. Now, if, so if you are a disciple of Jesus, then you are called to teach others to obey everything that he has commanded you. You are called to teach others what you yourself have lived out. You and I are called to be disciples of Jesus and make disciples of others. That is our church's mission. In fact, a mission given to all churches. And that involves being students or apprentices of Jesus and being teachers who teach others what we have lived out. We are called to be a community of students and teachers. And that is a high calling. I have often said that Listening to Sunday sermons is not enough. The main limitation of a sermon is that it promotes passivity by giving you fish. So I would like to encourage you to learn how to fish so that you can feed yourself with the Word of God daily for the rest of your lives. And that's an essential part of being disciples of Jesus. And here at Petty Church, we have opportunities to learn how to fish through small groups. In our small groups, we encourage you to read the Bible for yourself, think deeply about what you are hearing, learn from one another, fellowship with one another, and pray for one another. Small groups encourage you to be active agents of your own spiritual growth. And this month, in our small groups, we are starting our study of Colossians, one of the hidden gems among the Apostle Paul's letters. So if you're not yet part of a small group, we invite you to join one of our small groups. And you can do so by registering online from our website. Also, it takes only three people to start a small group. So if you are interested in starting a small group, please do let me know. As I close this message, I would like to invite you to a moment of silent meditation. In the silence of our hearts, let us take a moment to listen with our heart and pay close attention to what the Lord is saying to us.
Lord Jesus, we have heard your word. Now help us, Lord, to live it and put on your character. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.